What's going on y'all? Real Films 1998 back here with another one. Today we're bringing it back to 2002 with Spider-Man. This film is about to celebrate its 20th anniversary and it's time it had the highest grossing opening weekend of all time. The film was even one of the first superhero movies to get critical acclaim and it was taken seriously in an art form that never would have taken it seriously prior. Spider-Man by this point was already a household name. He was up there in popularity with Batman and Superman. Where does this story begin? Are you sure you want to know? Back in the early 1990s, James Cameron was set to direct the first big Spider-Man film with Leonardo DiCaprio starring. This project eventually failed, but is probably for the better. Some parts of the script have leaked online over the years, and I'm glad we didn't get this film. Although I would have loved to see his vision for it, the parts of the script that I've seen were awful. Some of the worst ideas that I've ever heard regarding the wall crawler came from it. However, he did have some great ideas as well. Some of them, like not making the web shooters, got reworked into Raimi's film a few years down the road. In 1998, two great things came. One being Marvel sells the rights of Spider-Man to Sony, and the latter being yours truly was born. This was a massive shakeup for Marvel and helped them recover from having to declare bankruptcy. Comics in the mid to late 90s just weren't selling like they used to. This was well after the Golden Age. Sony would eventually choose Sam Raimi as their director and would choose Tobey Maguire to star as the webhead himself. Sam wanted to make the chemistry between MJ and Peter feel real, so he would have the auditions for MJ opposite of Tobey's Peter. Kirsten Dunst came to be the best choice. The chemistry was instantaneously noticeable. Sam also had to send somebody out to Italy so that Willem Dafoe could audition for Norman Osborn, a.k.a. Green Goblin. There were some obstacles that the cast and crew had to overcome. However, everything fell into place after a while. This was Sam's first big-budget film, and he shot it like a small-budget film. There was CG, but the main fight scenes between Spider-Man and Gobby were punches and kicks. There was maybe two aerial battles, and they don't look that bad. On the flip side of that coin, the first time Peter suits up, when he goes after Uncle Ben's killer, the CG, while great in its time, looks very dated by today's standards. That's not a bad thing, though. This film was the campiest of the trilogy, and things like that work for it. Speaking of campiness, we have to talk about Willem Dafoe as the goblin half. I don't know if it was intended to be hilarious, but everything he says to me is comedic gold. From him screaming, we'll meet again Spider-Man at the festival, to him yelling at Aunt May to finish it. The goblin was hilarious. The problem with that is that he only felt intimidating for a few brief moments. Those being on the bridge, when he had MJ in one hand and the metal box of children in the other. That was the only time I ever thought he meant every word that he said. I don't think it's Willem's fault though. I think the script was a bit too comic booky, which in its own right would have worked perfectly. The film also tried to take itself seriously at other moments, so it made for a weird tone in my opinion. Toby plays a picture-perfect Peter Parker. Try that one five times fast. As good as Toby did, the standout performance was Willem Dafoe. He basically had to play two people, one completely insane and the other going insane. Willem had conversations with himself in the mirror, and they were some of the most entertaining conversations in the whole film. It was a bit all over the place, but it fit in perfectly with the tone. This story served as an origin for both Peter becoming Spider-Man and Norman becoming the Green Goblin. This film also gave us our first look at the best casting of all time in J.K. Simmons as J. Jonah Jameson. Peter is on a class trip when he gets bitten by a genetically enhanced spider, whereas Norman didn't want to wait for human trials on his experimental performance enhancers, the legal way Sony got around saying the super soldier serum. Peter is taking out the trash when he sees MJ storm out of her house. MJ doesn't have an easy home life. They're constantly at each other's neck. Peter tries to lighten the mood by saying everybody shouts. They start talking about where they want to go after they're finished with school. MJ is nervous to tell Peter what she wants to do because she never had the support she needed growing up. In a house that was constantly fighting, there isn't any room for support. She does end up telling Peter she wants to be on Broadway and thinks that it's a childish or stupid dream because that's probably what she's always been told. Peter gives her words of encouragement, and just as he does, her face lights up almost as if she's never had somebody believe in her before. Soon after, Flash pulls up in his new car. Her entire demeanor changes from intelligent and sophisticated to the quote-unquote popular schoolgirl. Peter wants to impress her, so he looks in the paper for car ads. He sees the cheapest one going for about $3,000. He also sees an opportunity to enter a wrestling gig and earn that money. He decides to do it. As he's rushing out of the house, Uncle Ben offers to drive him to the library. That's where he told them he was going. Ben tries to have a serious talk with Peter, but Peter isn't having it. Little did he know that this would be the last conversation he has with his uncle. He goes to the wrestling gig and wins the match. The guy doesn't pay him the whole amount that was promised. The man gets robbed. Peter could have easily stopped the robber, but he doesn't out of spite. Peter goes outside to see that somebody has been shot. The robber took Ben's car and shot him in the gut. He will always remember the last thing Ben said to him. With great power comes great responsibility. Peter hears on a police radio where the suspect is headed. He runs off, suits up, and goes after it. Once he catches Ben's car, the robber runs into and is trapped in a warehouse. The thug pulls a gun on Spidey. Pete twists his wrist and makes him drop the gun. Light shines in through the window so Peter can see that it's the man he let go at the wrestling gig. The webhead intimidates the thug into taking a couple steps back. 
He trips and falls out the window. The police are outside and they now think that Spider-Man threw the man out the window. He has to get out of there as fast as possible. Peter gets a job taking photos of Spider-Man for the Daily Bugle. After handing his pictures into JJ one day, Goblin pops up and threatens him. Something that truly surprises me is how much journalistic integrity he has. He may be a cold and bitter old man, but he is a journalist first and foremost. When asked who takes the pictures of Spidey, J. Jonah doesn't give up Pete at all. Peter, of course, swings in and has Gobby let Jameson go. Now J.J. thinks that they're in it together, though. Goblin lets out gas to make Spidey pass out, then proceeds to take him to a rooftop. When Peter awakens, Gobby tries to offer him friendship, but then Peter spat in his face. Peter knows his responsibility to do what's right and to fight for the people that now can't fight for themselves against someone like Goblin. The scene with the most, and in my opinion, the only real feeling of tension is on the bridge into the final battle. Once Pete saves MJ and the children, Gobby knocks him into an abandoned building for the real fighting to commence. One major reason why this fight scene still holds up is because it uses a very small amount of CG. It's almost all just punches and kicks being thrown. Sam Raimi is a fantastic director who at this point in his career had already made the Evil Dead films that were beloved by many. He then went on to make arguably the greatest superhero film of all time with Spider-Man 2. As far as Spider-Man goes, I have my issues with this film. I still love it for what it is though. I don't know if it was their intent to make Goblin funny or not, but they did. And in my opinion, it made the movie all the better for it. I'm constantly laughing when he's on screen. The funniest thing to come out of this trilogy is the memes. Whether it's Pizza Time or the moment from Spider-Man 3 where Pete is dancing to get on up in the streets of the city. These films have very funny moments, however the funny moments should be coming mainly from Spider-Man. His quips or lack thereof are my biggest issue with this trilogy as a whole. Yes he makes a couple, but they aren't really delivered or written well. A lot of them just kind of seem tacked on to me. Almost as if someone while filming on set said, you know Spider-Man is supposed to quip right? And they added one in every time that happened. I'm going to give the original Spider-Man film a 6.5 out of 10. While I love it, there's a lot of room for improvement on it. Luckily for us, Sam and Toby did improve with the sequel. This was a main component to the start of the comic book movie boom of the 2000s. X-Men had come out a year prior and Blade a couple years before that. They both did fairly well, but nothing like what Spider-Man did for the genre. This film had unimaginable success. And honestly, it's almost a miracle that it ever got made in the first place. Sam Raimi's Spider-Man. Let me know your thoughts on it and where you would rank it with the others down below in the comments section. A special thanks to anyone sticking around to the end. If you enjoyed the review, subscribe. Maybe even hit the like button if you're feeling a bit crazy. Until next time, film fans. Peace.